you have to go to the moon and back and send a spacecraft uh, in, in optimal time to conserve fuel consumption and come back to the Earth uh, on time. So that was a very different problem than I thought uh, a baby trying to learn how to move would have to solve. And in particular, it was, it was a problem because it just uh, um, enlarged the space of the search space uh, quite a bit because you had to uh, then do um, uh, not only uh, not only do uh, time uh, the, the estimation of the path, but also the estimation of the temporal profile. So that makes the problem highly intractable, uh, and and you enter into this course of dimensionality. So I turned then instead uh, uh, of looking at this field that was actually not addressing the problem of degrees of freedom because it was. Uh, modeling a planar arm moving on, on a, on a two-dimensional uh, plane uh, with two degrees of freedom only. So there was no redundancy. So I couldn't really look at that for, for what I was interested in. So I went and looked at the work of Esther Kellen, who's a developmental psychologist who actually figured out that the whole development problem was, was approached the, the wrong way. Uh, and she brought up uh, approach in a very static way, a very linear way, uh, uh, using models that were inappropriate to, to capture what, what babies do and how they explore and so on. So when, uh, when you, what you got was this, uh, uh, she brought into the field a, a, a nonlinear uh, complex dynamic systems approach and completely revolutionized in the 80s what uh, psychologists were doing in studying development. Then uh, by the 1990, there were two, uh, two um, uh, developments in the field of motor control that caught my attention in, in because of the problem I, I was trying to solve. One was the uncontrolled manifold concept, which uh, uh, addresses the problem of variability, and for the first time begins to think about uh, different types of variability that to define tasks of relevant dimensions in any given context versus tasks, they call it task irrelevant dimensions. Uh, and, uh, and later, I, I sort of um, began to understand that, that it's actually a, a task uh, incidental dimensions that support and, and provide a lot of uh, the adaptive learning that, that we see in, in adaptive motor control. The second piece of, of work there was by Harrison Wolford. It was a paper that really uh, turned, turned the, 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 the field into a different direction where we started to uh, try to understand at different layers of the nervous system the, the noise, the concept of noise uh, in the signal and, and the noise to signal ratio. But in 2001, I had completed my PhD thesis and had provided a series of geometric solutions uh, to this problem where I had uh, decomposed the problem into the past generation, the problem of trajectory formation in general, into a, a past generation uh, uh, that was geometrically optimal with respect to the distance metric of, of the, the space <coughs> involved, the internal configuration space and the space of the end effect. And I, I had uh, provided empirical um, data supporting the notion that this operability exists at least for goal directed behavior in movements that are deliberate, that are staged and that have uh, a particular purpose. And so uh, by, by 2012, I have become very curious about uh, complex motions uh, performed by, art, by artists, performing artists, ballet dancers and uh, pop, uh, modern dancers and and by, uh, particularly by athletes, by, by high performance athletes. And uh, around that time, I discovered a new class of movements, uh, which I termed, I coined as spontaneous or um, um, consequential, because they, they were not uh, instructed and they were not guided by a particular goal, goal directly. <clears throat> but most importantly, what these movements uh, demonstrated empirically was that there was a, a direct dependence on the dynamics, unlike the goal-directed movements that were deliberate and were dynamic invariant. So in this case, the geometry of the paths actually changed with the demands of the dynamics, unlike the movements that are cognitively controlled. 
And, uh, and that gave me uh, a, an opportunity to begin thinking about different classes uh, of taxon uh, taxonomy of different classes of different layers of biorhythmic activity from autonomic, from somatic, and from central nervous systems. And I began to explore in thousands of individuals the signatures, the stochastic signatures of these motions with the purpose of creating a new platform to revolutionize uh, the clinical uh, applications to actually translate uh, all the clinical uh, uh, tests that we have into a new uh, framework uh, for, for precision medicine, a new platform that, that um, all the people have developed to uh, form a personalized um, uh, targeted treatment uh, in cancer research, but in, in psychiatry, then I saw there is an opportunity to utilize this uh, framework and redefine the way that we study behavior. So I'm going to now walk you a little bit through the modeling that I did earlier on, uh, uh, based on the problem of the on bursting, the degrees of freedom problem. <laughs> and, and the problem uh, 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 illustrated here with a, a toy model of Panam that has seven degrees of freedom. Uh, so these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So that's a, a subset of the degrees of freedom that an arm has. And the problem is that you have a many to one map from many uh, configurations, possible configurations. I'm illustrating just three configurations here uh, that map to the same end effector. And the question that Bernstein asked was, how come we have a systematic solution and, and, and a solution that is consistent all the time when, in fact, because we have over 600 degrees of freedom across the body, we could actually uh, perform a trajectory in many different ways. So how do we do that? So, um, uh, the, so the problem is, yes, the problem is then how do you, uh, uh, even an N effect, or how do you find the inverse map? So is the problem how do you find a solution, or how do you find the best solution? A solution, because there's never a best, a best, a best solution overall. But there is a, there is a best solution for every context or every task. But then if there are many solutions, why is it difficult to find a solution? Because the, the smoothness of the paths is important, and you would not have that if you, if you um, at every 10 step, recruited arbitrarily a degree of So there is a connectivity there that emerges non-trivially. Uh, so so, so I, I propose to then um, conceive this problem geometrically and uncover a way to generate the paths along um, uh, two manifolds that would be representing the internal configurations of space that, uh, that give rise to different postures of the body and, and the end effect or space where we define goals and we could define uh, uh, constraints and, and the context. And so I, uh, what I did was then uh, build a, a, an embedding, this is called a, local, a locally linear isometric embedding, and what you do is you uh, define the geometry of, of, the, of the smaller dimensional space and we're embedding the higher dimensional space, preserving the metric. This is called um, uh, the pullback, where you compose the map. You first you define a full map, and then you compose that map with the internal uh, configuration space. And so you pull it back, and when you when you uh, measure the distances in the space where you're actually planning the motion, uh, you're, uh, you're also then measuring the distances in the internal configuration space. And, and this is the differential that I built. Uh, it, it is a, a, a gradient, but it's not just any gradient like in, in common gradient descent. It's a contravariant gradient. It uses the natural gradient of the space of, of, of tasks and configurations that you define. And that comes from uh, considering the metric the distance metric, the norm that you have in the space where you define your goals and your and your tasks, and and, and combining it with the Jacobian, uh, which is the, the derivative, the matrix of, of the derivative of your coordinates, and and then bringing it to to the configuration space. So you are bringing back the geometry of the 
of the external space where you, where you can define any kinds of you can find any task or any goals as a general, and then you bring that back into the internal configuration space, and you bring that. Uh, now you you bring that metric. But what this gives you is the ability to model many different tasks and recruit dimensions. So it's not that we have redundant dimensions. We actually um, can uh, uh, the brain can uh, recruit degrees of freedom as needed demand, depending on the task. And you can then change the geometry of the space where you define your task and your context. And, and that has an impact in changing the geometry of the internal configuration space. <coughs> and you're thinking about all this in a deterministic setting rather than in a noisy setting? So yeah, so the, the initial um, uh, solution to do this was deterministic because it's a very complex problem. So the, the initial question was, how do we do this? Um, in such a way that we define the, the, the optimal path for a given set of conditions. So that would be the geodesic to travel from point A to point B. The, the unique solution would be geometric, since it's the shortest, for that particular space. Then, um, as so you optimal see the in the sense of what you were asking before? I mean, what? Uh, yeah. Sorry? Optimal in, in, in the sense of minimizing time? Distance. Distance. Okay. Remember, I have decouple time from space here. Right? And it will become uh, more more obvious in the next slides. But essentially, when once you do this, you can decompose that uh, high dimensional space into the dimensions that are relevant to the task, much like the uncontrolled manifold people did. But in this case, I think it would be appropriate geometry. And so the other dimensions are flowing there. And these are. Uh, then uh, enable you to study two different types of variability in co directed behavior. Then you switch to a stochastic approach. And then you can do this while considering the variability of the system. Uh, so, so, oh, yeah. the I think that I would like to move so that I can, it's, it's a lot to cover because yeah. then I get into the stochastic part. But I will take all your questions afterwards. So now uh, we have a situation where we have three degrees of freedom defined by the position of the target, for example. And then uh, that will recruit three of the degrees of freedom in that embedding. So you are navigating in three degrees of freedom in the internal configuration in space that is defined by the three uh, dimensions of that external space. Now you can add another dimension because say that you want to grasp, not just point, but grasp. And now the problem is that you have to match the orientation of your hand appropriately to the orientation of your cup. Otherwise, you won't be able to grasp it. So that recruits another dimension. Now let's say that you are opening the door of your, of your and you were, you're carrying a bag. So you're constraining your, your, the plane of the arm. So you can also model that you know, to create torque. Uh, so all these different geometries, these are just toy examples. Uh, can then uh, be modeled and that can can then um, uh, release uh, reveal the degrees of freedom that are uh, uh, that are relevant to that task, but also the variability of the degrees of freedom that are floating that are kind of supporting uh, the other uh, task relevant space. And you can uh, you can then recruit for four, for five, and so on. And, and what I like people to think about these, because so these are these are studies that are just don't center on the person, but most of what we do is social, and so we can bring this to the social domain by now recruiting the degrees of freedom that the other person has as well when you went train with that person in a social dance, and so and that that will be maybe later. Um, so so here the question is how do we then uh, so the model. Uh, the model decouples the, the generation of forces, the dynamics, which gives you the time profile of the motion from the geometry, which gives you the path. So is that actually empirically valid? So up until that point, that question had not been asked because the models were coupled. So you have, uh, you were generating, the model's trajectory formation were generating both the temporal profile and the path. Um, and so one way that you can do this is by, uh, by varying the speed of the movement, because speed is distance travel, the only time. So you can then uh, probe the geometry, and you probe the temporal profile as well. So we um, designed this experiment where we would 
vary the initial configuration of the arm with different postures that, that uh, corresponded to the same location space so that you can uh, kind of model that manifold of self-motion that the hypothesis would call the self-motion manifold that doesn't move your hand. You just move in configuration of space. You travel a path, but you're not traveling a path in, in the end effect. So, uh, and then we would do that as we would do that with different speeds that were called at random. And again, the question was whether the path would be conserved. Now, the path was conserved. We, we varied all the speeds. And when we gathered all the speeds that were instructed, uh, people were very good. This was very automatic behavior. And they were very good at differentiating the different speeds. So the speed profiles in time, they said that the amplitude of the speed in centimeters per second. And what you can see is that they traveled uh, very similar path. And what they also conserve here is the distance traveled to the peak velocity point over here uh, prior to the deceleration phase to, to stop. And so the interesting thing is that in this case, what the system was uh, varying was this uh, parameter I call it tau, which is the time to reach the peak velocity. So I then moved this up to the configuration space of the higher dimensions. And there we have four, four in the case of orientation matching, four uh, dimensions that were recruited because we have the position, but we also have the orientation angle. And this is actual data. So these are all, this, all the participants collapsed. And what we're, what we're plotting here is the orientation error and the position error as they reach to grasp for the cylinder. Uh, match orientation. They didn't actually do the grasping because that's another uh, ball of wax with all the fingers and, and so on. So it's just match uh, orientation match. And and so regardless of the speed, so uh, the different uh, speeds that we tried, uh, there was a corticulation of the of the four joints in that in that task relevant manifold, and that's important because you could have. Uh, you could have serially solved this problem by first um, displacing, then rotating, then displacing, then rotating, and because of the abundant degrees of freedom that we have, but what the system does is it coarticulates and, and decouples that four-dimensional space from the rest of uh, the other, the other uh, three dimensions in this case. Um, and so we also, when we vary the initial posture, that, that invariant remained uh, for, the, or for the orientation um, and the position relationship. And, and so it did when we vary the orientation of the target. So uh, you have to match different orientations coming from the same position and from the same postural initial configuration. So uh, that provided a set of invariants. And then we moved to more complex tasks where we have to actually uh, uh, avoid obstacles. Um, so this is just without obstacles, then we started placing obstacles and making the task quite complicated. Uh, and so this is the model, but uh, and it's, it is, this is just the flow of the equation of the differential. And it's, 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 it's reaching in, in, in multiple ways and, and so on and so on. Now, these are, uh, these are geodesics uh, paths with respect to the distance metric that defines the obstacle avoidance. Uh, which is different from the distance metric that defines uh, the orientation matching and so on. So you can accomplish uh, this model in two ways. One is by conserving the metric by changing the coordinate functions that define your map, or by conserving the coordinate map and changing the metric. And they're, they're equivalent. And so so here now we are, and I, I moved to Patek to, to work with Richard Anderson and try to, uh, this model um, uh, also I used, to, so that the work I just spoke about is my PhD thesis. And, um, a third of the thesis uh, is empirical work to try and uh, bring home that message of the, the coupling of force generation and the equations of motion to generate action in for, uh, based on, 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 a, on a force independent geometric solution. And the other part was uh, artificial neural networks, which my advisor, David Zissa, was one of the uh, people who pioneered sort of the artificial neural network uh, framework to, 
to uh, uncover game fields and so on. And so here, yeah, don't work with Richie Anderson. And because the, the artificial neural network model makes may certain predictions about uh, past generation uh, that, that uh, and this, and this geometric solution, then I move to Caltech to learn the physiology and begin to explore this decoupling of the space time in the posterior prior cortex where you have all these uh, coordinate representations and sensory motor integration and sensory motor transformation. So I went there and the first thing was to uh, begin to record in tandem the spike activity with the full body uh, activity. And in this case, I, I could afford to, to do it with sensors that I placed on the on the animal. So these are these are data from Bruce's macaques. And they they were uh, trained to reach straight to a target. So they, they were training that the they uh, reach in paradigm where you flash a target and then they have to wait for a variable amount of time to reach the target. And during that amount of time where they're not moving, they're not performing the action, uh, but they're thinking about it, I, I perform those recordings to see the extent to which the activity in the posterior parietal cortex could predict the path uh, both in the, in the postural configuration space of the arm and also in the hand space. So before, before the, uh, launching into the, the spike analysis and, and, and recordings, I uh, model, uh, build a model of, of the trajectory generation, and I test it uh, now to see if, if the invariance uh, would keep. Now, the speed invariant did keep, and uh, it was very interesting because these animals were not trained to perform this task. They would get only the training every each day that they that they were exposed to. And so the, from the first time, they had resolved the path length, okay, the entire path, and the path curvature. And what they were actually exploring was the distance traveled up to the peak velocity point over here, which corresponds to this dot. So these are the, the speed profiles corresponding to this path. The blue ones are corresponding to the learning phase. And by if, uh, after a few trials, they would adapt, and they would actually consistently travel the same distance, much like in the other experiments that I showed you with humans and the orientation matches. So now you have a consistent distance travel up to the point of peak velocity. But all along, all along, all these points were reached at the same time. So, the, so whereas the, this uh, result here gave me evidence that, in fact, it would be very um, inefficient to try and model this use, using the optimal control framework because there is this time coupling in that model. But but each trajectory is different here in time. So you have not only a different duration of the, of the integral, you, you also have a different uh, altogether uh, uh, travel, uh, travel profile along that uh, path. That th this path can be modeled as geodesics. So these are geodesics in some space. And, and, and these are, these are the, the time to reach that peak. And eventually, then they all converge to the same kind of distance travel. And uh, I, this is just for one target. Obviously, I mapped out the entire space of the reach. So uh, there are different asymmetries there that uh, you have to consider. And so I mapped the entire time uh, space. And then I was able to show systematically the deformations that that map of, of time across space suffers when you put an obstacle. So you can model. Uh, the geometry of that time, uh, of, of that, and estimate time from space essentially by figuring out the proper distance metric that will give you the consistent pass duration. Now, in the process of doing that, I realized there is there is a symmetry here that emerges, which is uh, the area constrained um, between two different uh, geodesic curves. And so this was a prediction of the model when you do judicic popping from one geometry to another, there is a conservation. And so I, I'm, 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 the example here produces the Euclidean geodesic between these two points and also the geodesic corresponding to the model of the obstacle avoidance. And, and, and the, maximum, the point of maximum curvature around, around uh, that path defines this, this region here and the area uh, in this region, the ratio given by the area in this region divided by the total area is one half, and the perimeter here is also divided by the total perimeter is one half. Now that's the prediction of the model. So the question was, how does this hold? Does this hold water in the in the actual data? Data. Turns out that 
Here's what it does. So there, this is a, this is the very dramatic differences across the space um, when you put these obstacles and you change the, the, the geometric demands from a straight line to a curved path, and when you change, therefore, uh, the dynamics that you need to actually control that arm motion. And this is the map of all the time to peak velocity. This is the type tau parameter in milliseconds across the space. So this is the map that eventually gives you, uh, um, once you figure out the distance to travel each to each of those uh, for, for that amount of time, you figure out the consistent distance, you figure out the metric, then you figure out the, 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 the time duration of the entire path. And so uh, all along where you have all these variations, uh, so green represents the learning and uh, of the temporal dynamics, and, and uh, I mean, blue represents the learning of the temporal dynamics, and green represents the steady solution that the system finds. And all along you have this scatter uh, that is centered at, at about one half. So there is a conservation. Of course, it's a stochastic, so you have variations, but it's uh, very different with respect to the amount of variations that you can afford with the different uh, degrees of freedom that you are recruiting. And so um, at, that, at that point, I then tested the same, because remember, we have an embedding, and now we have a copy of that space. This is all in the hands and the vector space in the configuration space. So now we go to the configuration space. This is the, this is the end vector space. We go to the configuration space and recover the seven joint angles. And indeed, there is that conservation as well. So not only the conservation happens in the space that you're planning and you're kind of aware of, but it also happens in the proprioceptive domain where you actually, this is data, this is not the model, this is the actual data. And so at that point, I was ready to begin recording. And so I, I had a good understanding of, of the phenomenology behind this, this whole learning adaptation process. Um, the, the recordings actually took place throughout the, the learning once I stabilized the animal uh, preparation. And, uh, and, then, and then these are this is an example of one cell and how it walks from different uh, uh, receptive fields uh, in the pseudoparietal cortex as the animal adapts. So this is an example of a cell that completely shuts down for several seconds and doesn't spike for several seconds. So it's, it's, it's like in, infinity when you are in, in a physiology time scale and then recovers and return back to, to that, to, to closer to the original. And then the adapts again when you, you remove the obstacle and there is this uh, remnant uh, uh, behavior of, of curved spaces. I did this in 180 uh, neurons, uh, single cell recordings, and discovered two types of cells. This was really interesting, uh, where one was a uh, uh, putative excitatory pyramidal cell with wide uh, sp spike width, and one was putative inhibitory interneurons uh, with narrow spike width. And this was around the time that uh, the lab of John Reynolds made that discovery as well in the visual area V4. And, uh, and the interesting thing in our case, though, that was that there was a total correspondence between the behavior of the neurons and how they were ramping up uh, the firing rates for the case uh, of, the, of the red neurons here, the imputed in inhibitory narrow spiking cells, and, uh, for, and how they were dampening for, for, for the case of the uh, the excitatory white spiking uh, cells. And so as, and this is in the untrained, uh, a case when they're learning the temporal profile, but they have already resolved the geometry of the path. And so the gain, the code or code here is the gain of the cell. So uh, in up to 50 spikes per second, they gain or they, uh, in, or they uh, suppress. And so this is after they are trained and they have managed to, to learn uh, the, the temporal profile along the geometric uh, path. And so uh, very consistent across two animals, and in parallel, I was actually uh, very curious about the retracting trajectory of the animal. So the animals perform a goal-directed behavior that is quite deliberate, but, but then there is an uninstructed and completely uh, goalless uh, uh, behavior there where they retract back to rest. So I became fasc fascinated by that movement, that, that type of motion, because it's uninstructed, and I wonder if it contained any kind of information on the variability that could, uh, that could guide me in understanding better uh, uh, how the system was resolving these 
uh, degree, degree of freedom embedded in complex behaviors of the entire body. Now, I began with a simpler paradigm of a pointing, pointing behavior, but then uh, in, pointing in the dark. But then I, I, I probed different uh, uh, situations, one in which the person had to uh, uh, only re uh, uh, remember the target in, in the dark. So it had to be guided by proprioceptive information. Another one in which there was an allocentric cue, the target remained on, so he received visual feedback continuously. And then the other one, the target went off. But then an LED was put uh, situated on the finger so that he could align <coughs> the, uh, the coordinate frame of, of the proprioceptive uh, world with that of the visual world and have them align and see. And the question was uh, whether uh, those invariants that we found in the monkey work uh, would hold water in the, uh, in the actual work, uh, human world and whether they would break down with disease. And so the first thing that was, I did was to then begin to uh, dissect these two types of movements, a deliberate stage movement to a goal, a goal directed, and the movements that are spontaneous in nature. You don't, uh, you, you don't instruct them, they don't follow a particular goal. They're more of a consequence of the movements that you just completed with intent. <coughs> and indeed, in Parkinson's disease, I realized that even very early on, uh, when the severity is mild, when you're starting the disease, these movements are broadcasting that there is a problem. And you can see that, that for different speeds, this, this spontaneous retraction uh, now cannot uh, this differentiate um, you know, what, what the instructor speed was. But more importantly, uh, in the control uh, participants, these, uh, the scatter of this symmetry of the area and, agreement ratios was, was maintained uh, across these different conditions, but they, they selectively broke in, the, in, in patients that had uh, Parkinson and, and patients that had a stroke in the posterior prior to cortex. And the question was, what kind of uh, sensory guidance could I use to actually recoup the symmetry or any relationship between uh, that I found in controls between the, the, the deliberate and the spontaneous mode of action? And so in the Parkinson's patient, it turns out that aligning the proprioceptive axis with the visual axis on the moving finger anchor at the, on the body uh, brought them back to uh, comparable performance. But in the posterior prior cortex, and this is a stroke in the left posterior prior cortex, which turned out to be different from what you find in the hemineck leg when there is a stroke in the right posterior prior cortex, and I can tell you why that is, because we learned that as well. Uh, but then that's where the, 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 the allocentric uh, continuous visual feedback is what actually aligns them. So we found a way to actually take this symmetry and begin to explore ways to selectively extract the, the, the source of sensory guidance that most likely would, uh, uh, would help these patients. And at that point, I was fascinated by these spontaneous movements and wanted to see what they were doing in highly complex behaviors. And to that end, I started to, to study athletes. So this is a competitive athlete. And he's, he's uh, performing the Jack Draws with the Poker Cup. And he is doing that at, at different speeds that we call it handle. Uh, as much as in the other experiment that I showed that we did with the presentation. And then, uh, because I'm, I'm very interested in this question of the speed invariance, the dynamic invariance of this path, I also put uh, uh, sandbags here on his uh, arms to offset the center of mass and to change the whole mass distribution and the dynamics to see if we can break that symmetry and if we can break that invariance. And if, in fact, uh, when you do the entire body and you recruit all those degrees of freedom that you need to perform this task, if, if the whole geometric invariance goes by that. So, uh, so th then, then he, he, of course, is. Uh, um, now uh, performing a little bit slowly, but he adapts. Uh, and what we found was that it has actually been observed by the change of mass distribution. Uh, but most interesting, uh, now the price is such a 
transit trajectories, they, uh, they continue to be around, along, around 200 to, to 300 hertz, there are some other, but then we, we can study very precisely all of the body, and in particular, I'm just going to focus on the trajectories of the, of the hand. So here you have the speed profiles of the jab forward, and simultaneously as he is retracting, spontaneously retracting the jab backwards, he's deploying the cross, Okay, so this jab, cross, hook, <laughs> uppercut. And, and the retractions there go very fast, so an observer misses them, and even the person, he, he's, he's been training since four years old, he had no idea that they existed. Because uh, they are trained on the forward deliberate punching of the, uh, to the opponent. So now this is, this is happening simultaneously here, so jab, forward, Simultaneously retraction while deploying cross, simultaneously retracting while deploying cook, simultaneously retracting while deploying uppercut, and then he resumes. And here is the, uh, the so we did this with both modes, uh, 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 instructing uh, at random and evoking uh, the, 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 the change in speed. So two different modes in both of them the results were congruent, but I'm going to show you the, the, the instructed speed at random. And this is, uh, so, so he essentially was really good at, at uh, cutting it in, in half the, the, the speed of the movement. And so what, what I want you to, to notice here is the, uh, the conservation of the geometry, so the shape of the path is not changing um, despite the changes in dynamics. But now when we gather all of those paths that were performed at random, at a random speed, now we see that uh, the, the, the slow and fast are, are conserving the, the curvature of the path, but when you, when you, you look at the ones that are distracting, they are, uh, they are speed dependent. So the dynamics are actually changing the geometry of the path. So this goes for two different ways of conceiving these motions, one intended, where it is a uh, dynamic invariant, and one continuous, where it's not, it's dynamic invariant. Yeah. If you go back to the previous yes. slide, when you went from the, or when you went from the uh, normal speed to the fast speed, the overall structure seems to have been preserved, but there are some high frequency components which are very different. Yes, yes. Are you going to comment on that? Uh, well, we, we then study um, sort of the variations uh, within the stochastic framework and separated also these two movements. Uh, and we, we realized, uh, I don't know if it's the, the high frequency components or other, because we haven't done the, the frequency domain analysis on those motions, so we just did a temporal domain. But these, these, uh, these motions here that are spontaneously um, sort of reflecting the contextual variation, so they will tell you, uh, whereas these, these motions tell you um, so the goal of the movement, they are serving the goal, the other ones will tell you all about the context, whether the light was on, they would separate whether he was moving in front of the mirror, whether uh, there were, they were mass upset in his arms. So there is a conservation. We call this the accordion effect, because it's essentially like that. But within that, all that variability that is so informative of the adaptive process is going in the uh, spontaneous domain. Now, in both the spontaneous and the deliberate world, uh, you have uh, you have the, these two manifolds that take, tell you the task relevant dimension versus the task uh, um, sort of um, supporting dimensions uh, that are kind of their reasoning. And so they are different when they are fundamentally different when the movement is intended versus when the movement is being spontaneously supporting the intended movement as a consequence of it. If you try to essentially have an affine map, you know, of uh, shrinking in the vertical and horizontal direction, how much variation would you see? I don't know. I haven't okay. done it. Yeah. But, but this opens a whole different line of, uh, a, a completely different optic on the problem of motor control that the brain might be resolving. And so, um, so, so, so the essential, the essential message here is like that there is no conservation. This is the uppercut return, and whereas the, the, the deliberate path is actually highly conserved, the geometry is not. And so we, we 
did a little bit of machine learning on it and trained uh, a classifier, a lead one out classifier, to classify the different movements uh, within each mode of deliberate versus spontaneous. And what we learned from that was that the system never, never confuses uh, deliberate with spontaneous. Uh, and that it does the variability actually extracts better the, the spontaneous segments you're tracking. And we, we, we did this to the, the worst naive individual and, um, and actually uh, still maintain that the, the deliberate and the spontaneous movements were, were in fact, um, so actually I am, <laughs> the, the time is up. Uh, okay. Well, let me just uh, close with uh, with the adolescent, because this, this takes you to the stochastic world now. Uh, with the adolescent, uh, uh, with, with with the autistic world, and I want to kind of uh, bring this uh, because uh, uh, it breaks. Hands up. Good. Watching yourself in the mirror as you. And um, what, what we thought was remarkable here was that he was sitting there playing video games over here. He, he didn't lift his eyes once to, to, do, to see his sister. This was an experiment, had nothing to do with autism. I was trying to see the interference that knowing one sport uh, would have with learning in new sports. And so I found his sister was the captain of the lacrosse team at Rutgers at the time. And so she was a lacrosse player, and I found a professional tennis player and so on, so on, a dance and so on. And I was just trying to see uh, how if that would interfere with the learning of a new routine in boxing and all these parameters and variants and so on. And Jimmy was sitting here and, and, and his sister said, hey Jimmy, you want to do this? And he said, sure, sure. So we suit him up, he, he does it. And that was the first time ever he ever did any kind of Martial, art, martial arts or anything like that. It took every every participant for this to to the, to the lab to actually piece up together in a fluid manner the, uh, the the routine. But in his case, he did it immediately. He had some kind of photographic memory. Now, this is the, the shocker uh, at the time. So, a typical uh, uh, peak velocity amplitude. Uh, distribution of a typical person looks like that. And we were modeling that up to them as a multiplicative process using the low normal family. And when we, when Jimmy visited us, we, we, we discovered that in fact in autism, uh, there is the presence of the exponential distribution, which then brought us to rethink the whole modeling of this into a broader um, way in a sense. And so we adopted uh, um, an additive process and started modeling as a, um, as under the general rubric of Poisson random process. And in particular, we found that the gamma process was very good representation of what of the noise uh, that we needed to um, to explore in autism. And indeed, uh, his his body, uh, his, uh, his uh, performance, his uh, variability uh, did confuse uh, spontaneous and deliberate motions. And, uh, so uh, that, that uh, brought us to a completely different uh, type of modeling. Uh, I, will, I will have to finish, but I just want to show you here uh, the performance of the typical child and the performance of a typical autistic child. It's the amount of noise that they have in their system. Uh, I, this is empirical data, but we have modeled this quite precisely. And by now, this is where we are. We have derived a power law uh, map in, in probability space. This is the shape and the scale of the distribution telling you about the noise to signal ratio versus the, uh, uh, um, the maturation changes that, that, the, that the, the typical system experienced from three years of age all the way to 60. Uh, year, years of age and, and the type of maturation is absent in autism. So here you have uh, much uh, children and an adult uh, from 3 to 25. And so we have defined now the target for treatment and we know how to intervene. We actually de develop several interventions that are uh, actually um, providing uh, a lot of information. So I'm going to stop there. I have a lot more, but uh, uh,
this is sort of where we are. We now brought the entire gradient model that I uh, did in my PhD thesis to the stochastic realm. So now we're in probability space doing the same thing and predicting the space appropriately. Thank you very much. Time for a few questions before we move for uh, great. Yeah. Two so, Mark, uh, hello. Um, you have shown in your own way what also has been then shown in other uh, places, namely that in unconstrained pointing movements, the path is in, in Euclidean space, in the extrinsic space. There has been a very interesting experiment by Danzinger and Mosei Valdi, who manipulated a very simple, more virtual joystick experiment, where they showed that when you move from point to point, you, again, the subject moves in a straight line, shortest path. However, when a joint system is shown, in his case, a two-joint system, the path was actually the geodesic of joint space in, in torus, in the torus. So as you have moved from these highly simplified, simple point-to-point -point movements and shown in spontaneous movement that deviations start to come in, I'm wondering, and maybe let me also one more time refer to one of your experiments in darkness. I'm wondering whether at times, under certain conditions that deviate from that idealized, visually guided point-to-point -point movement, joint space kicks in and determines, say, a geodesic that is then observed in, in the movements. Have you thought back on to how joint space might, might become also important in these non-ideal movements? you can, or I wasn't, clear enough to convey that this is a solution in joint space. <laughs> I thought you had, you had shown the endpoint space, right? No, no, both. Uh, the the geodesic happens yeah. in, 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 in joint space. And the fundamental difference between my work and the rest of the field is that I decouple the time that you take to travel on that geodesic being a geodesic in that high dimensional space, which now uh, uh, partitions that space into the the embedding part, which corresponds one to one to the desired part in N effector, the geodesic happens in the internal space. What you see in the N effector is a projection. So the Euclidean case is, is just a very particular case that was actually in the literature present because it was imposed. It was actually right. enforced. Right. And what I did with my work was relax that condition and let the body move freely and explore both uh, the geometry and the, and the temporal, uh, the forces gen necessary to generate the temporal profiles. So it's a, a fundamental departure from solving this uh, from the Newtonian approach and using the Lagrangian and the, and, the, and the Hamiltonian to actually solve this problem and moving away from optimal control theory, which has this time dependency that forces you as, a, as, a, as an experimentalist to just move into dimensions because of the course of dimensionality. So what I did was a fundamental departure uh, because it, it, it split the problem into uh, the geometric component and the forces, and separated them and demonstrated empirically that actually in deliberate movement this is the case. But however, when you do things spontaneously, they, then you need to rethink the whole model and take into consideration contextual variations and so on. So I'm offering a new framework to actually think about uh, how to do model control. Very different from what was done here. Last question. Thanks. How do you impose learning rules? I mean, it's a global solution, right? No, it's a local solution. It's a local solution, and the, the reason why we can do it locally is because all of these things that have little signs and cosines uh, designed uh, uh, with a small e at, a, at an epsilon uh, size, the sign of x and x. But the solution is that geodesic so in that space, right? Sorry? As a solution that the model control is a geodesic in that space. The, the it, it's, at the end, it's a geodesic, uh, but it doesn't. A local perturbation, how would you learn it? You recover from it because locally, uh, you change the target now, or you change the overall distance that you're that you're trying to navigate, so you then 
deviate from it. That's how we solve their obstacle avoidance problem. But it's a local solution. It's it's just a step, a differential. We should continue this conversation over the break. But thank you. And we'll be back because we're running a bit late. We'll be back at 11.20 and we start at 6.00. Yeah, how are you? Thank you.